Welcome everyone to Money Mondays with Melissa. We have a few quick housekeeping items to cover before we begin. The first of which is to let you know that we are recording today's event, which will be made available for viewing on demand. Everyone who registered to re attend will receive an email with a link after the conclusion of today's town hall meeting. All participant lines are muted, so if you're having any technical issues, please use the chat feature to let us know and we'll try to assist you. Madam Treasurer, I'll now turn it over to you. All right, and I know that everyone is still coming in. Can we allow just a few seconds for all the participants to come on, if that's okay? Yes, definitely. Okay. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you and welcome to Money Mondays with Melissa, the investment edition. We're happy to see the number of participants that were able to attend during this lunch hour. We know that a few months ago during the height of COVID-19 pandemic, we began Money Mondays with Melissa because we wanted to bring Chicagoans valuable resources for staying financially healthy. This series was developed for residents as well as small business owners. A lot has happened even in these past few months. We had to switch gears a bit and focus on our Road to Recovery series, where we dedicated several weeks to helping communities and small businesses rebuild after the killings of Mr. George Floyd, Ms. Breonna Taylor, and so many others. We know that many people are facing extraordinary challenges right now. That's physically, emotionally, and financially. So we've spent the past few months talking about available resources during this pandemic. The Treasurer's Office has also spent the past few months working to address the unprecedented financial hardship that our city small businesses are facing with the Small Business Resiliency Fund, which you'll hear more about in a few minutes. But today, we want to focus on the financial health and the finances of the city. We know that in the past few months, the markets have been volatile. So we thought that this was an important time to update you on how the city is managing its investment portfolio and how the pension funds are doing in this time of volatility. It might not seem as relevant as to what's in your checking account, but the finances of the city affect every one of its residents. As your city treasurer, my role is to protect and grow your taxpayer dollars. As city treasurer, I am also responsible for financial empowerment. That's helping people to learn more about ways to protect and grow to improve their quality of life, whether that's in areas like home ownership, saving for college and preparing for retirement. We've really worked hard to do that within just one year of being in office. But for the sake of time, I won't go through all of the initiatives, but I will highlight a few. Within a few months of being in office in 2019, we developed and held the first ever broker dealer symposium for firms and institutions doing business with our, with our office. We had over 250 industry players in attendance, and I know that some of them are joining this webinar on today. That symposium gave us an idea. We developed a scorecard, kind of like what they use in baseball, but instead of calculating batting averages, we're calculating how diverse a firm is and how much it gives back to the community. This scorecard determines who we choose to do business with. It emphasizes accountability and transparency because we believe that the firms that we do business with in the city of Chicago should look like the citizens of Chicago. These firms should not take their profits and go home. We want them to invest in our neighborhoods and invest in businesses and programs that will make a difference for the people of our great city. This is the right thing to do, but it is also the profitable thing to do. And there is data to support this initiative. 
A 2017 international report by McKinsey showed that companies with a high level of worker diversity were 33% more likely to exceed the median profits of their peers. It also showed that companies with women in prominent leadership roles were 21% more likely to have a more profitable bottom line. In 2019, in the city treasurer's office, 33% of our broker-dealer firms were minority, women, or disabled veteran-owned firms. In, in 2020, with our new diversity and inclusion scorecard, that number is now up to 42%. And by the way, this scorecard is the first that we've heard of even across the country. More recently, we are working to address the urgent problems that our city is facing. We all know that systemic racism is embedded throughout so many institutions in our society, including the banking industry. That's why last week on Juneteenth, I, along with Illinois State Treasurer Michael Ferrix, we announced the creation of the Advancing Equity and Banking Commission. This will be a year-long collaborative effort with leaders at banking institutions to examine and recommend changes that will eradicate systemic racism in banking and provide equity, whether that's through hiring, lending practices, just to name a few. You will hear more about this banking commission in the coming months. But on today, on our investment edition of Money Mondays with Melissa, we are happy to have with us a few people that have been instrumental in these efforts that I just mentioned. Our Chief Investment Officer, Craig Slack, and Chief Impact Officer, Ashley Evans. They'll share updates on our investments as well as the social impact. Because for me, I always say that it's not good enough to just invest taxpayers' dollars. We must, we must leverage taxpayers' money and work to change systems that change lives. We will also look into the city's pension funds and speak with two other guests, Lorna Scott, Chief Investment Officer of the Firemen's Annuity and Benefit Fund, and Steve Ewan, Investment Officer of the Municipal Employees Annuity and Benefit Fund. But first I want to introduce Kwaku Obed, Managing Director at Marquette Associates. Kwaku will lay the foundation for today's webinar and provide a general market overview and talk to us about managing investment portfolios in these uncertain times. Thank Kwaku, thank you so much for being here and joining us on this afternoon. We thank you for having me. Kwaku, we know that your firm that is one of the largest indep independent investment consulting firms in the country and has been in business actually for over 30 years. Let's look at what has happened these past few months. Can you share your perspective on the effect that the pandemic has had on the economy and the financial markets? Yes, absolutely. And once again, thank you for uh, having me today and uh, looking forward to a great discussion. And really, if we think about COVID-19, uh, we think about its impact on the financial markets and the economy, uh, to say the least, it's been very disruptive. So as an example, we go back to the first quarter and we think about the S&P 500 as an example. Uh, the S&P 500 lost 20% in the first quarter alone. Uh, the S&P, very similar to other segments of the equity markets in the US, were also down around 20%. Uh, to give you a sense of just how much of a global uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 has been, we also think about the international markets, and the international markets were also down at least 20% during this period of time. So I've spoken about the equity markets, but we think about fixed income, and fixed income has also seen unprecedented moves because of COVID-19. Uh, in the U.S., for example, we think about the Fed. And the Fed has, in fact, lowered interest rates on an emergency basis. Uh, this was, in fact, one of the measures used to stimulate the economy. So we think about interest rates being low. Low interest rates will hopefully help the economy hum along uh, since debt is cheaper, it's cheaper to borrow, and so on. It's just one of those stimulus measures uh, that's in the traditional toolbox of the Fed. 
Uh, we also think about the economy itself. Why did the Fed look to lower interest rates? So firstly, we had the markets, but then we think about unemployment. Unemployment before the end of the first quarter was around 4%. That skyrocketed up to around 14%. Uh, that's the official count. Uh, there's an argument that the number could be slightly higher if we think about uh, those that have been furloughed, as well as those that are underemployed at this point in time. Uh, in addition to the Fed, uh, we think about the federal government itself, and we think about the CARES Act and other stimulus measures where uh, monies have been appropriated uh, for spending, once again, to stimulate the economy. And to put the CARES Act and uh, ongoing stimulus into context, we think about the bailouts of 2008, 2009, and just how much headline uh, those uh, bailouts caused, we were looking at 680 billion at that point. Uh, the CARES Act and the other stimulus measures around 4 trillion. So again, really just gives you a sense of just how unprecedented things have been with COVID-19. Uh, I definitely want to look at the glass half full as opposed to be completely pessimistic about how things are. So I mentioned the first quarter and I mentioned how the market had lost at least 20%. Uh, since the first quarter, we've seen a very strong market rally and we're close to, if not, uh, at break even from what we lost uh, since the end of the first quarter. So that is promising news there. Uh, the other piece of promising news is around uh, the progress of a vaccine. Uh, so the fact that we are heading towards what looks to be successful clinical trials for a COVID-19 vaccine, that's also uh, a positive. So again, really just want to balance things out to say that yes, COVID has been very disruptive. Uh, things probably won't be the same with respect to how we work, how we interact, and uh, you know how how many businesses do make it out of this environment. Uh, but with that being said, uh, you know there's a tendency for humankind to progress and do the right thing and and uh, hold up well during these times. So again, I definitely want to sprinkle some news of positivity. Uh, again, going around to the vaccine and going through to the market rebounding uh, since the losses we saw in the first quarter. Very insightful, very helpful, and it's 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 knowledgeable, and and it's information that I know that those that are listening could could definitely use, um, not just within our city's portfolio, but within their own investments that they have personally. Um, so part of my job as city treasurer is to be the sole custodian of the city's investments and to make sure that our $9 billion portfolio grows to ensure the economic health of Chicago. So for residents, we manage a $9 billion portfolio on your behalf. Some of us may call us your personal banker. So we have Craig Slack on the line, who is our chief investment officer within the treasurer's office. Craig, you are on the front lines of making that happen. As Kwaku is clearly in a new world, how has COVID-19 shifted how we manage the city's investment portfolio within the treasurer's office? Um, mute, Craig. Sorry, Madam Treasurer, we were having some some difficulty with uh, with the reverb, so I didn't want to destroy uh, your intro. But thank you for having me. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's no, and not lost on me that your Monday series has gotten valuable information and resources into the hands of so many residents and small businesses. Uh, so it's a pleasure to join you here today. Um, I know how important uh, transparency is to you, so I really applaud you for wanting to come forward uh, at what is a very difficult and unique time uh, in our history. Um, it's hard to believe, uh, it seems like years ago, but it was just February that we were out touring the city uh, discussing our performance from 2019 and I think rightfully touting some of the great accomplishments your office had made for the year. Uh, I guess little did we know it was lurking right around the corner, literally. Um, but um, uh, as, we, as we look to have a dialogue about the, the investment portfolio and, and, and the strategy shifts that we've made as a result of COVID, I thought it was maybe helpful just to take a quick step back and review why we have an investment portfolio in the first place how it's managed and constructed, and maybe some of the unique challenges that uh, we face as a municipality. You've heard me say many times that the reason the city has an investment portfolio is because we have revenues that are coming in and expenses that are going out. And there 
is a mismatch in the timing of those cash flows. Uh, while you rightfully indicate that we have $9 billion, uh, that's money that's come in from a, a number of the different revenue sources that the city has. Uh, and most of that money is earmarked for an expense that we're going to incur at some point in the future. But that's a balanced budget, right? Um, but, uh, you know, while we have that money under our, our watch, we call it our investment portfolio, our assets under management. You're going to hear a lot from your guests from the pension funds about active management styles. For us, we look to manage our assets in a more passive style. Uh, I'm looking to construct a well-diversified, high-quality liquid portfolio of fixed income securities. Quake, you mentioned both equities and fixed income. Uh, I need to make sure that we place a high degree of importance on our, our pre-purchase fundamental analysis, our due diligence, our asset selection, because my intent is to hold those securities for an extended period of time. So we need to ensure that that portfolio can withstand a wide range of economic cycles uh, and market volatility. Um, you always hear me talking about trying to achieve the highest risk adjusted returns possible. Uh, but I think it's important to note that as a municipality, we're, we're different. Um, you pointed out some of the civic responsibilities that we have uh, that other institutional investors just don't necessarily have. Um, uh, we need to make sure, as you point out, uh, that we're using taxpayer dollars to drive impact. Um, where possible, we're looking to uh, guide our activity through municipal depositories uh, and broker dealers who are conscious of their diversity, inclusion, and corporate social responsibility. Uh, as part of our fundamental analysis, we're also looking at our asset selection through an ESG lens to determine how our investments are meeting environmental, social, and governance criteria. And I'm not sure if, if uh, our, our participants today know, but Chicago recently became the first uh, signatory for the United Nations supported principles uh, for responsible investment. You, you hear me use the term, our acronym UNPRI all the time. It's through UNPRI that our office has committed to six core principles of social responsible uh, and sustainable investing. One of the things that we're so proud of uh, is the fact that our portfolio, uh, one of the only portfolios in the country uh, that has achieved a carbon neutral status. And I know Ashley is going to be talking uh, at length about some of the pure impact investing her team is doing on behalf uh, of the office. Um, so while we're different, we're certainly not immune to, uh, to, the, uh, to the effects of a pandemic. So as, as things hit, uh, we were obviously, we obviously saw an impact uh, Quaku did an excellent job of articulating COVID's impact on the financial markets. But for me, it's really the speed and violence with which this pandemic hit that made it like nothing I'd ever seen before. You know, rates coming down in isolation obviously help fixed income valuations and, and make our, our portfolio more valuable. But it's extreme illiquidity and gapping wider, uh, significantly widening credit spreads that are a severe negative. Uh, I've, I've been asked many times, you know, how have you changed your investment policy for, to account for COVID? And the answer is, I haven't. Uh, we have a sound investment policy in place, and I've created a portfolio that, uh, that was constructed to withstand an economic downturn turn just like this. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a passive manager, we're a buy and hold uh, investor. So we're not able to really look to, to aggressively trade our way through this market. I'd probably be wrong anyway. But being, uh, being passive doesn't mean we're, we're doing nothing. Uh, while I haven't changed, I look to change our policy, I have, I have shifted our strategy. As a municipality, first and foremost, we need to be aware that we're a fiduciary of taxpayer dollars. So we, intend, uh, we needed to immediately shift our focus to liquidity and the preservation of capital. You know, the governor uh, issued a statewide stay at home order on March 20th. And at that time, there was really no, long, uh, no idea how long a quarantine would last, uh, but it'd be naive and foolish to think that you could completely close down a state and its economy and really the entire country for three plus months and it wouldn't have a negative impact on our local finances. So, so what have we done? Um, I want to focus first on liquidity. Um, the first thing I did was look to build our, our reserve position or what we call cash uh, to what I think is a prudent level. Uh, which was significantly higher than where it would, would have been pre-pandemic. The second thing that I've done is shifted all of our incoming maturities to a short-term liquidity strategy. We basically built a 90-day maturity ladder that uh, 
to have a significant amount of, of cash that will come due each and every week. And this, would, uh, this allows us to organically grow our liquidity position very quickly uh, and significantly should the need arise. Um, you, you hear me talk about cash flows all the time, but in this time, it's, it's, even, more, it's even more urgent that we have our arms around our, our, our cash flows. Uh, but for me, it was important to uh, look at potential negative outcomes. Uh, so I've had my portfolio managers look to, on a weekly basis, run simulations that, uh, that simulate significant drags on our revenue uh, and, and really amp up our expenses. Uh, and uh, I would say under even drastic scenarios, we are on target to meet all of our liquidity needs. Um, it, it's interesting, we've actually seen April and May numbers. Um, we'll get June's in about a week and a half. Uh, and so far, the, the results have been very, very encouraging. Um, revenues have not declined nearly as much as I would have feared. Uh, and it's been really interesting to me to see that expenses have come down as well. So those net, net out against each other in a positive way. Um, now, I naturally expect that there would be a lag, uh, so we've braced ourselves for June, July, and even August, but, but I feel confident that we're positioned appropriately. Uh, I would also point out as, as a last point on liquidity that as a result of COVID, uh, we've, we've created an outsized, unrealized gain position on the portfolio. And what that does is allows us to have additional flexibility should things get significantly worse. Uh, and if, if, if liquidity is one, uh, then preservation of capital is 1A. Uh, as a fiduciary, you know that we need to ensure that we're doing everything in our power to safeguard taxpayers' dollars. Uh, as I mentioned, we do a comprehensive credit review on our, on our portfolio as a part of pre-purchase pre fundamental analysis. But as a result of the pandemic, I've had my portfolio managers do uh, con and conduct an, an exhaustive review on the city's uh, uh, entire investment portfolio. We looked at each and every position that we hold. Uh, as a result of that effort, we, we saw a few things that we didn't feel comfortable holding in this new normal, uh, and we proactively looked to move away from those positions. Uh, and of course, there's going to be names and sectors that we are staying away from uh, going forward. But I think it's important to note that our portfolio, our overall portfolio uh, credit rating is AA plus and stable. Um, so we feel good about where we stand from a credit perspective. Uh, and we're well positioned to withstand a, proactive, a protracted uh, decline in economic activity. You know, Kwaku talked a lot about how we've, we've had a significant snapback in the financial markets, but we know the backdrop remains uncertain. Uh, you know, how, how uh, as the states reopen, are we gonna see a second wave of, of infection? Uh, we're all hearing about the civil unrest. Uh, we should see a contentious uh, election in November. So uh, I always worry that I'm not worried about enough. Uh, so I think the backdrop uh, will remain challenging. Um, so it, it, it's important that we remain vigilant uh, in monitoring our liquidity position uh, and, the, and the risks of negative credit migration in the city's portfolio. And, and most importantly, it's gonna be important to act swiftly should circumstances dictate a shift in direction. Thank you, Craig. I was thinking about something as you were saying. Um, Craig, plus, let's mute for a second. Craig. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about something as you were speaking, um, and Kwaku, in regards to so many factors that affect the market. You spoke about the pandemic and, the, you know, just the shutdown for the past few months. You spoke about civil unrest. And we spoke about even the possibility of a second wave of the pandemic as far as the peak of it. And so these are all factors that affect the market, affect the portfolio, not just of us, but, you know, just the markets in, in, in its totality. So really thank you for that clarification. And that's, that's knowledge that I think a lot of people can take away from them to understand that all of this, all of these external factors affect what's going on with the market. And Craig, I wanted to ask a follow-up question as well, because we've spoken about interest rates many times in the past. And I remember you mentioning the possibility of a 0% interest rate. Well, here we are. Interest rates were lowered to zero in March. It's hard for a lot of people to wrap their minds around that. How does that impact what we're doing with the city's investment portfolio? 
Yeah, and, and you, you know how much I like to be right. Um, but this was not one of those times, clearly. Uh, I, I guess, uh, Kwaku, I'm just glad we're not here explaining, trying to explain what, what to do in negative interest rates. Um, you know, as Kwaku mentioned, the Federal Reserve cut their key interest rates, uh, their key Fed funds rate, uh, in an emergency meeting on March 3rd. And, and anytime I see uh, an interfund, uh, an intermeeting uh, cut, uh, or something on an emergency basis, you know, I, I start to think, what do they know that, that I don't know? And, and I think that's when we were all trying to still convince ourselves that we were dealing with a flu, flu epidemic. Um, and then again, uh, they cut by 100 basis points at the regularly scheduled meeting on March 15th to a, a range of 0 to 0.25. Uh, in, in sort of subsequent uh, testimony and comments, Fed Chairman Powell uh, committed to stay away, staying away from pushing Fed funds into negative territory, but he did pledge to keep rates at near zero for an extended period of time to ensure economic recovery. Uh, so that's really what I mean about zero interest rate environment. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's really that pledge uh, and the unprecedented stimulus uh, from the Federal Reserve and the, and the Department of the Treasury uh, that Kwaku mentions that's, that's responsible for that sharp snap back that he mentioned in his comments. Uh, you know, lower interest rates are, are, are great for what we own, uh, but they make it really challenging for what we're trying to achieve moving forward. I talked about the uncertainty about, uh, of cash flows and, and, and the result, as a result of COVID and the need to build cash reserves and short-term securities to ensure our liquidity position. Uh, but uh, it's become a really expensive proposition, to be honest. Uh, there's no doubt that, that lower interest rates are becoming a drag on our overall portfolio yields. But on the positive side, uh, a large portion of our portfolio is held in higher yielding, longer duration securities. So when, when rates tend to come crashing down as quickly as they have, uh, those longer assets are gonna help cushion some of the decline. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it will improve our, our overall un, unrealized gain position. I guess the good news uh, is that there's still a positive slope to the yield curve. It's about 120 basis points from two years to 30. Uh, so you do benefit from extending maturities uh, and credit spreads, while not as attractive as they were in March and April, still remain at what I would describe as, as historically generous levels. Uh, one of the real positives for us uh, was as the pandemic really erupted in the markets and credit spreads gapped out, liquidity became non-existent. We were in a unique position to be opportunistic buyers. As a result, we were able to take advantage of some of the severe dislocation in the market. And just a couple months later, uh, we've seen all of those positions snap back to more, uh, more historically uh, appropriate levels. So we've, we've been able to lock in some, some really good, uh, great yields and, and of course produce uh, some profits. So, um, you know, we've also been, been taking advantage of some things that I see as opportunities in the market. And I have uh, look to increase our hold, our weightings to things like government-backed, mortgage-backed securities, uh, AAA-rated asset-backed securities, high-quality corporate bonds, uh, and taxable municipals. But with that said, uh, it, it's certainly reasonable to expect that our overall portfolio income numbers for 2020 will be below where they were for 2019, which was, you know, by all measures, a great year. Um, I've done some projections, uh, and I would expect us uh, to come in closer to 2018 levels, uh, but well above 2017. So while not as good as 2019, still relatively strong. The key for, the key for us, Madam Treasurer, is really going to be as the city, as the state, and as our country begin to reopen, is to properly interpret the signs of recovery in that return to a more normal mobility pattern. And that's when we'll be able to take our, ease our foot off the brake a bit, bring that cash position down to a more historically appropriate level, and then actually begin to step on the accelerator again. So Craig, I just want to make certain that I heard you correctly. So even during this pandemic, and so I'm going to speak in layman terms right now, okay? Even during this pandemic, you are saying that although, you know, last year we spoke about near record number of, I think the, tre well, not think, I know the treasurer's office, we um, were able to grow taxpayers portfolio over $221 million. So we made $221 million on top of the taxpayers portfolio. That's what we did in the treasurer's office last year. Now, what we're saying is that during this pandemic, 
while we cannot state, especially we don't know about how phase two may go, we cannot state that we will make over $221 million on top of the portfolio, earn that money for the residents. We still believe that we are going to be able to make well over hundreds of millions of dollars for the residents. Is that correct? That's correct, Madam Treasurer. That's a that's that's good information <laughs> for our residents. I know what you want to hear. I know that's what you want to hear. Yeah, that's what we want to hear. Let's you know, as they say, money talks. So let's let's talk the numbers here. Yeah. So we believe that with the strategy that we currently have in the city treasurer's office, that we will still be able to grow the taxpayers' portfolio. Obviously, not as much as we were able to do in 2019 because the market was much better at that time. And we know that it's very volatile at this time. But that's still you know, good, great for residents here because they are listening in and we want them to know that we are being great stewards of the portfolio. And with the strategy that we have, we, we are still looking to make an, a return. So thank you very much. Yeah, they, they, they can certainly rest, uh, rest well at night. That's my job to stay up at night to worry about. Very good, very good. Thank you very much, Craig. That was very helpful, great information. And thank you for the explanation. I think that's what's even more important. And so now we want to kind of turn to the impact side of our office. I'm going to turn it over to Ashley Evans, who is our chief impact officer. And I mentioned during my opening comments that I tell my staff all the time, shame on us if all we're concerned about is making money. We need to change lives. And so social impact is about what makes people's lives better in the neighborhood where they live and where they work, where they worship and where the kids go to school. And so Ashley, Craig and I were just talking about socially responsible investing, but you know, one of my top priorities is the impact that we're making on the residents of the city. And when we talk about impact, we're saying we're leveraging taxpayers' money. We want to leverage it to make an impact. And so you took over as chief impact officer about six months ago now. And in that short time, you and your team have already done just amazing initiatives, have really made progress in an effort to get resources to the city small businesses. Let's talk a little bit about the Chicago Community Catalyst Fund and the City of Chicago Small Business Resiliency Fund and what we're doing to work with them on that. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Is my volume good? Uh, our office is excited uh, to support the impact investing ecosystem and to provide opportunities to educate, inspire, and activate potential investors as well. Um, this has been an important year for us as we begin to redefine the way the treasurer's office looks at investing. Um, in an era in which communities are struggling and programs to support them are less and less effective, all of us, uh, philanthropy, the private sector, and the government, need to work together to find new and more sustainable solutions to very old problems. This is why the Catalyst Fund, the City of Chicago's first public social impact fund came to life. We make investments with the intention to generate positive and measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. The investment strategy aligns with impact goals. Currently, the fund has $50 million in committed ca capital available to increase economic opportunity across the city and across projects related to job creation, small business growth, affordable housing, sustainability, education, and even healthcare. Layered into the investment strategy is the same premise that launched the Advancing Equity and Banking Commission. We started with the belief that it is critical to apply an equity lens to everything we do to address disparities caused by systemic racism. So for example, in 2016, the median wealth for Black and Hispanic families was $17,000 and $20,000 respectively, compared with white families who had a median wealth of $171,000. In other words, White families' net worth is 10 times that of Black families. And in Chicago, we know that about 19% of its residents live below the poverty line, with a per capita income of about $35,000 per year. So, Madam Treasurer, as you always say, 
it's not enough for us to just make the city money. We have the opportunity here to really change people's lives. So let's talk more about the Catalyst Fund's impact. Within the last 90 days, the Catalyst Fund has committed $25 million to the Small Business Resiliency Fund, a loan fund launched in partnership with Mayor Lightfoot to help small businesses in Chicago during their greatest time of need since the Great Depression. $10 million has since been invested with Axion Chicago, with another $15 million to be invested with local community development financial institutions like CNI MFG and CRF USA. We all heard about the inequities of the Paycheck Protection Program, which left behind too many small and minority-owned businesses. Um, just 12% of Black and, and Latinx business owners who applied reported receiving requested amounts. So the Catalyst Fund is directly and intentionally addressing some of those disparities. Currently, 100% of loans have been given to businesses in low to moderate income communities, with over 50% given to low income communities. Of all the businesses, more than 54% are minority owned and 36% are women owned. But we aren't stopping there. The Catalyst Fund will be announcing its first public request for new investments this fall, led by Kwaku and his team at Marquette Associates. We intend to make two to three more investments of up to $5 million this year. So to learn more about the Catalyst Fund and its upcoming public request, or to learn how to become an investor in the fund and help us do more, please visit chicagocatalystfund.com or email info at chicagocatalystfund.com. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And as city treasurer of Chicago, what, what many people may not know, um, I am the chairman of the Chicago Community Catalyst Fund as city treasurer. And as chairman of the Chicago Community Catalyst Fund, I partnered with Mayor Lyford on the Small Business Resiliency Fund that Ashley was just speaking about. And so that, was, that is a great initiative that money is still being dispersed on. So I know there were so many people that applied and they may be asking what's going on, what's the status? Money has been deployed, but not all of it at this point. We are still in the process of deploying money for that fund. So please um, be certain to stay on the lookout to, to get updates on that. And thank you, Ashley, for providing that and also mentioning that we are going to be making other investments um, from the Chicago Community Catalyst Fund, even through this year. Considering the pandemic and everything that is going on, this is what it's all about. We should be helping and certainly to being part of the solution. So thank you, Ashley, for that update. And I know that they mentioned our website, chicagocommunitycatalystfund.com. Is that correct, Ashley? Chicagocatalystfund.com. Okay, not community. Yes, chicagocatalystfund.com. Chicago Chicago yes, you got it. Thank you for... And we certainly look forward to even more work that the Catalyst Fund will be doing and our office, so thank you for that. And so what we're going to do for this um, last portion as we get ready to conclude, we have done so wonderful in making certain that we conclude and have this within our one hour lunch hour. Um, I wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit and really look into our, our pension funds. Um, but I'm, I'm very proud, I, I want to say, of the work that our team is doing within the treasurer's office. We heard from Craig and speaking about our investments and how we're making money on behalf of the residents. We heard from Ashley in talking about how we're making an impact with the money that we are investing in the treasurer's office. But I wanna switch gears and, and invite Lorna Scott in, Chief Investment Officer of the Fireman's Annuity and Benefit Fund, and Steve Ewan, Investment Officer of the Municipal Employees Annuity and Benefit Fund, to join Kwaku Obed, who is the Managing Director of Marquette Associates. Kwaku opened up with remarks on today. And we're gonna talk about on the next part of our conversation about the city's pension funds. So thank you all for being here. And what many may not know is that as the city treasurer of Chicago, I am the only elected official that sits on all four of the city's pension, for, pension boards. And that is fire, police, municipal, and laborers. And that's really a job 
within itself, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I do take that role very seriously because it directly impacts so many Chicagoans all over the city because it impacts the taxes that residents will pay. And so we are pleased to have Lorna and Steve here today because they, along with Kwaku, can talk about what it means to manage our pension funds in this unprecedented times. So Kwaku, I'd, I'd also like to mention that you serve as the consultant to both Chicago's municipal and laborers pension funds. So you work with chief investment officers like Lorna and Steve. Can you tell us how you work together? Give us a high level overview of how a pension fund like the city's functions and tell us what people should be watching for as they're reading and listening to the headlines. Sure thing. So my colleagues and I at Marquette, uh, we work with a number of pension funds, uh, including uh, the ones that you just mentioned, uh, municipal and laborers in the city of Chicago. And our role really is to work as a partner to staff the board uh, and really fulfill our fiduciary obligation. So we do that in a number of different ways. Firstly, uh, one of our key roles is to work with staff and the board on setting the asset allocation. Uh, so as Craig mentioned, for example, uh, you know, his job is to make sure that he worries so other people can sleep at night. Our job is to make sure that we put together an asset allocation framework that takes into account the adequate levels of risk that need to be taken. Uh, we want to be very sensitive to liquidity requirements. We want to be sensitive to fees uh, and so on. So it's our, it's our job to really partner with uh, the pension funds uh, to fulfill that vision for the asset allocation. Uh, in addition to asset allocation, there's also manager selection. So we know the asset classes we're going to invest in, which managers are going to invest within the portfolio. And then ultimately, our job is to look at different scenarios within the asset allocation, uh, stress testing the portfolio, making sure that, you know, there are minimal surprises when it comes to what could happen in the portfolio. And that also dovetails into the manager selection process, making sure that the managers we select are good complements to one another, and then really seeking to find active managers where active management makes sense, use passive management, i.e. index funds where that makes sense, and ultimately building a program uh, that's very logical and consistent from a risk management standpoint. Uh, so that's our key objective as a partner to the pension funds. Thank you, Kwaku. And so we know that, um, I'm, I'm gonna kind of bring Lorna and Steve in now. Thank you for your patience. Um, but you represent the Firemen's and the Municipal Annuity and Benefit Fund of Chicago. Can you tell us your fund's histories, who you serve, maybe describe your role as investment officer, enlighten those that are listening that may not be necessarily familiar with pension funds. They know what it is because they know where their tax dollars go, but may not as be familiar as we are with the pension funds. Lorna, I'll start with you, ladies first. Sure. So happy to be here and uh, thank you for having me. So I am with the Firemen's Fund of Chicago and the name says it all. The participants of the fund are the firefighters of the city of Chicago, but not in the name though are the other the fund's other participants and that's Chicago's paramedics. So it's firefighters and paramedics. Uh, the fund was established in 1931. So it's been around for a long time. And it's governed by state law, not by the city of Chicago, but by state law, by the Illinois Pension Code. So my fund, we have about 840 million in assets under management, and we use external managers to pick investments. And the fund has 22 external investment managers and 10 private market funds. So my role, so I oversee the investments in the fund. And what that means is I meet with investment managers, I review strategy and performance, as well as looking at accounting reconciliations and fee invoices. So my responsibility is to run the gamut. But most importantly, most importantly though, is I am not alone in managing these investments. Uh, the fund is governed by a board of eight trustees who meet monthly and investments is on the agenda every single month. So there's a lot of oversight to this fund. And additionally, the board has hired an investment consultant and that's Kellen who serves as a resource They've got an extensive research staff and top-notch investment analytics. So that's my fund in a nutshell. Thank you. And we'll move over to Steve Ewan for the Municipal Pension Fund. Thank you, Treasurer. 
Thank you, Treasurer. First of all, thank you so much for having me here today. I am, I am honored to represent the trustees and the, and the members that are on this call. MEBF or Chicago Muni is a $3.4 billion pension plan established in 1920 by the Illinois Pension Code. We have close to 75,000 members, uh, 32 active, 18 inactive, and 25,000 retired members. Our membership is comprised of the city employees, uh, such as crossing guards, OEMC members, CPS employees that are not teachers, and clearly not firemen, policemen, and uh, teachers, and the uh, and elected city officials, just to name a few. Our governance structure goes through five board of trustees, three elected trustees representing various trades and unions. We have close to 30 different unions uh, that are representing our membership. And, and two ex officios designated by the pension code. One is the uh, city comptroller, currently Rash Masoni, and the other is none other than Madam Treasurer. Um, my role as an investment officer and a fiduciary a, and a uh, sole investment uh, professional at the fund spans from operations, such as custody transactions, preparing investment sections of the audit and CAFR, all the way to investments such as idea generations, research, manager due diligence, and monitoring our portfolio on a daily basis. And more importantly, more rigorously during times like these where we're experiencing, experiencing sell-off and a volatility in the market. So literally and figuratively, as you can see, I don't know if you can tell, I haven't been able to get a haircut since January, uh, so I wear many hats. Back to you, Treasurer. <laughs> We can't tell that you haven't had a haircut since January, Steve. So that's great. You're doing well. Uh, but I think it's important to note that we heard from Lorna speaking about um, over $800 million in assets under management for the Fireman's Fund. And we heard from Steve and um, the Municipal Pension Fund is well over three, three and a half billion dollars. And so for the four pension funds that I sit on of the city's pension funds, the Fireman's Fund is the smallest in assets under management, and the municipal is the largest in assets under management. So this is a great dynamic duo that we have on today, and I think that we have the appropriate representation to be able to really paint a picture. So thank you both for being here. And while we've all been inundated, really inundated with news surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic and the tragic toll that is taking on human life. There has been so much focus on the physical aspect of COVID-19, but we also know that there is a financial toll that is taking, really which is why I started this Money Mondays with Melissa series. This disease has had a devastating impact on the economy and the financial markets, followed by a rebound after some stimulus followed by more shakiness. So really just a lot of uncertainty. I'd like to go around the panel and ask, how has COVID-19 impacted your fund's performance? And can you put that performance into some historical context for our audience? And Lorna, again, we'll start with you. Sure, no, performance, performance has been challenging. You know, at the end of March, like quite through Minship, when, when COVID began dominating headlines and there was a lot of uncertainty still, Fear, um, U.S. equity was down 20%. International equity was down about the same. And you know, my fund wasn't immune. We were down 17% for the year at the end of March. And that's quite a fall, given that we finished 2019 when the fund was up 21%. Um, but things have improved quite a bit since March, you know, as there's hope for a vaccine and there's progress in this economic recovery. And that's showing up in performance. So as of the end of May, FABF is down 8%. Um, so I'm glad we're having this conversation now and not at the end of March. But in the context of history, you know, there have been worse years. I mean, you can look back to 2008 during the global financial crisis. Our fund was down 36%. But what's most important during these times of stress is not to panic and sell everything. My board didn't panic in 2008. We remained invested and we benefited from the markets eventually rebounded. Same thing in March. My board did not panic at the end of March when we were down 17%. We stayed invested and we are seeing a recovery and we are participating in it. Steve? Unmute, Steve. <sighs> Sorry about that. 
Um, as Koiku provided a nice backdrop earlier, talking about our current and recent uh, market environment, you know, there seems to be some sort of a dislocation in the market where stock market is, you know, continuing to rise, uh, what seems to be a recovery, while the uh, economic data fundamentals are seeing another. You know, there's certainly, uh, this further bolsters the idea that the stock market is not the economy. However, you know, our, 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 uh, the recent recovery in the market certainly provided uh, benefits to the portfolio as well. Our year-to-date number uh, as of May 2020 was down 5%, and pretty much in line with S&P 500. However, during the height of the sell-off, which is better captured in Q1 2020, our portfolio provided a nice downside protection. Our portfolio was only down 13% in comparison to S&P 500, which is uh, down 20%, just using it as a proxy for the general market. And from the historical context, our portfolio also has done well. Our portfolio outperformed our benchmark, uh, performing 7% versus the 6.6% of the benchmark. Also, if you look at our calendar year returns, we provided it nice positive, strong positive returns eight times out of 10 years, beating our benchmarks as well. We also experienced a strong bounce back coming out of the global financial crisis in 08 into 09. So fund that is fully invested in, to all, in, all market, uh, in the market, as well as all major asset classes, you know, we, we will trend similar to the market, right? So when market goes up, our portfolio will go up and vice versa. You know, as a fiduciary, uh, Craig mentioned being a fiduciary uh, to the tax dollars, uh, we're doing the same thing here for our beneficiaries. So as our goal as a fiduciary is to mitigate the wild swings, the big gains to the big losses, and avoid the left tails as much as possible and provide downside protection. And I, and I believe our portfolio has done that. And it's good to know that we don't just throw darts at the wall for investments. The, this is a strategy that we have. And it's, it's, it's important to note, you mentioned Steve for, for a municipal, that eight out of the 10 years we beat the ben benchmark. And it's good to know that there is a benchmark, right? We make investments and we rate our performance compared to the industry. And so in the municipal pension fund, you mentioned that eight out of the 10 years that we've um, beat the benchmark, but also I wanted to make a note for the fireman's fund. Um, Lorna, you had mentioned that the fireman's fund in 2019 earned a return over 21%. Correct. 21%. And so that really helps during this volatile time that while we may have seen significant losses these past couple of months, which are rebounding, and that's the great part because a lot of people say, what do you do? What do you do? That, you know, everything is crashing. Um, but it's already within a couple of months, we are seeing some rebounds on that, which is great. But really those years that we have very strong performance really helps us when you have this economic downturn. And so it's important that we all work together, our investment officers, our consultants, that we all work together because during a time such as this, we have to be prepared. So really great work on that. Thank you both for, for really answering that. And so I'll go into um, one more question, and I think I have just one more after that. But given all of this uncertainty and the fact that we're in a new normal, one of the questions that I keep asking myself is, where do we go from here? Has the pandemic changed our strategies around asset allocation and manager selection? And where are the new opportunities? Lorna, you can begin. Sure. So our asset allocation has not changed. I mean, we are broadly invested across multiple asset classes, including equities, both international and domestic, fixed income, real assets, private equity, and some diversifying strategies. So our asset allocation would not change in response to current market events as it's designed to provide, to provide a targeted return over the long term. You know, and additionally, we're a smaller fund, so we don't allocate to specialized ditch strategies that may develop during times of market stress. Instead, we give our managers some broader mandates to go anywhere within their asset class, and particularly in fixed income. So that being said, the current market shakeup has provided opportunities at the manager level instead of at the asset allocation level. So we recently completed a uh, private equity search, and I've got two managers who are excited about the opportunities that they are seeing. And I've got other managers who have used this market to, in quote, prove the quality of their portfolio to buy really good companies at reduced prices. 
So in this kind of market, we're relying on our active managers to take advantage of the price facilitations to identify good investments that will give the fund good returns over the long term. So no change to asset allocation, but counting on active managers to find opportunities within their specific strategies. Steve? Sure. You know, I, I echo a lot of uh, what Lorna has said. You know, for us, short answer is that we're still here and we're still standing, staying the course. And, you know, I feel that our portfolio addresses the uh, current market environment. As you know, Treasurer, we've been uh, very active in the market and positioning our uh, portfolio in a defensive manner to protect on the downside, uh, which we have seen that our portfolio is doing and still participating on the upside. Since I joined the fund in 2017, we've been very active in the market. We brought on uh, defensive equity strategies. Uh, we realigned our risk budget in equities and fixed income. And we funded new asset classes in uh, infrastructure to bring in, to provide uh, uncorrelated returns and income generations. And lastly, uh, the, the board approved to fund global low volatility strategies to further provide that downside protection. So, you know, where do we go from here? You, you know, we, uh, MEABF, uh, as many institutional investors are, a long-term investor. So we need to keep our, maintain our long-term approach, keep our side on the long-term goal, stick to our uh, strategic asset allocation and stay the course. So, you know, having been established since the 1920s, you know, you can't imagine that we've gone through a lot of economic cycles and we're still standing here after 08. So, you know, some of the opportunities that I see, um, you know, with the, Craig talked about the uh, low interest rates and spreads uh, tightening and widening. You know, I feel that there's an opportunity to uncover in the credit strategies uh, for us. And, you know, to take advantage of that opportunity, our board recently have approved to change the guideline for hedge funds to include private credit to continue to diversify away from equities within our hedge funds. And, you know, I strongly believe that this is a time to take a closer look at your uh, governance structure. You know, during the quarantine, I've done a lot of research on TALF, uh, which is a term SFX security loan facilities. And, you know, whether TALF uh, 2.0 or 1.0 back then, uh, OI, uh, whether that makes sense or not is a discussion for another time. But I realized that a lot of public plans have, you know, uh, governance structures that would prevent them from taking advantage of these opportunities where we need to act quickly. So, for example, public uh, procurement policy, uh, as well as a slow nature in onboarding a strategy from start to finish. So creating a nimble and flexible governance structure is something that I'm interested in looking into. And finally, with everything that's happening in the country, uh, whether that's COVID, whether that is a, a racial injustice, and in continuation of uh, Treasurer's uh, Juneteenth event, I'll be doing a disservice at an address of uh, the diversity and inclusion in the investment community. It is ever so important for investment community to do our part in, in continuing to build on diversity and inclusion and provide equity to underserved communities. For institutional investors, specifically for public plans, which I can only speak for, we need to continue to promote diversity and in managers and brokers that are managing our money that resemble our membership. And for MWDB managers, you know, there will be opportunities coming out of this pandemic as well as a uh, uh, racial injustice, whether that is new asset classes, new strategy, or you know, rock star, uh, diverse portfolio manager coming out of a large investment firm to create his or her own. You know, you just need to continue to uh, uh, sharpen your skills and focus on what separates you from the pack. Uh, I rambled on, so I'll stop there. No, all great stuff. And and you know what? I'm going to actually. Um, invite Kwaku to um, be as the investment consultant. Really tell us how what some thoughts that he has on this question as well. Absolutely, and I would actually echo everything that Lorna and Steve have mentioned. So, really, as institutional investors, I think the hardest thing for us to do at this point is really stay on the sidelines. Right? We hear a lot, we see a lot, uh, we read a lot about everything happening in the market, but our job is not to time the market to day trade, to get into very short themes that may or may not play out. And it goes back to really the importance of the asset allocation. So again, spending that time with staff and the board to go through what the portfolio should do in times like this. So obviously we didn't plan for COVID to happen, uh, but we did plan for distressed environments to take place. So really looking at the portfolio, establishing whether fixed income performed how it should have, equities performed how they should have and so on. So 
at the grand scheme of things, we're not looking to change the asset allocations of our clients. But at the periphery, uh, particularly around, let's say, managers and managers being able to take um, uh, some of the dislocation to their advantage, uh, that's definitely something that we're looking into. Uh, some of the asset classes that uh, our clients are invested in, private equity being one of them, uh, they typically do pretty well in these environments where there's a good amount of dislocation. Uh, so again, to bring everything down, we wouldn't look to change everything seismically at the asset allocation level, but at the manager execution level, we would be having very detailed discussions with managers around that, surrounding their outlook over the short term and how over the short term they can capitalize in the context of being part of a longer term asset allocation. And I think that it's important to know, and, um, and, and Kwaku knows this um, as the investment consultant of two of the pension funds that I sit on, and as Steve mentioned, and Lorna, about diversity and inclusion. For me, it was very important. I, I speak about diversity and inclusion in the city treasurer's office. But for me, sitting on the four cities pension funds, it was extremely important that we focus on diversity and inclusion. Because I mentioned a moment ago that firemen's annuity fund being one of the smallest, um, being the smallest for the city, but over $800 million is not little money that the Firemen's Annuities Fund has uh, as assets under management. And then we look at the municipal with over three and a half billion dollars. Again, certainly that's not little money. And so we wanna make certain that when we have asset managers that are coming before the board and they are looking to invest and do business with us, we know that they are making money off of these investments. And so we need to make certain that there is diversity and inclusion. We also talk about giving back. We want to know how are you helping the neighborhoods of Chicago? And, and so we don't think that that's strange for asset managers to invest in Chicago, because we are making certain that we are doing business with people that care about Chicagoans. And so I really wanna thank the partnership of the investment consultants, but also for the work that our investments, the investment officers do on all of our pension funds to make certain that they are listening to what the trustees are stating. And certainly that is an initiative that is very near and dear to me. So thank you all for that. And I do have one final question. Um, and, and it's really, as a trustee, I mentioned of all the four pension funds. I know that you and your teams are doing a lot to get important information into the hands of your membership and the public. Can you talk about your efforts related to outreach and where people can go to get the vital resources and information during this difficult time? Lorna, we'll start with you and then Steve will follow. Sure. So Fireman's Fund, we are a staff of 15. So that's 15 of us who are available to talk to participants. So even in this work from home environment, we have staff who are monitoring our phones and are available. You know, and additionally, we, we post updates to our websites, you know, that's participant forums, meeting minutes, investment reports, financial statements. So lots of data is on our website. And finally, we distribute to our participants a monthly summary. It's an email blast that summarizes discussion from the monthly board meeting. And as part of the summary, the fund secretary includes the secretary's letter where he highlights and discusses important topics. So between phone, website, email, you know, our goal is to be available to our participants and communicate with them. Yeah, so, you know, everything Lorna has mentioned, our website, um, you can visit our website for information. You know, we're a public plan. We disclose all of our or most of our information on the public. And uh, you could visit our Facebook as well at Chai Muni Pension. And uh, we'll be sending out a, a bridged uh, CAFR to all of our active and retired members. So they could take a look at that in July. And uh, due to the uh, special circumstances this year, uh, we'll be adding in additional information to that as well. And you're more than welcome to send any information to at info at meabf.org uh, if you have any follow-up questions or uh, questions. Thank you both. And um, it's important to know that our meetings are open to the public. Oh, yeah. And so, 
<laughs> yes. And so that's important to note. And if you want to know about the four cities pension funds and when the meetings are, we actually have to post them. So they're on the website and that's information that you can learn about, including the agenda for the meetings. So hopefully that was helpful to someone. Kwaku, before we leave, I did want to go back because I did not get your response on this. And, and I apologize for this because I know that you've had some history with the pension funds. I do want to ask one final question of you that I asked of Lorna and Steve when we spoke about how COVID-19 has impacted the pension funds performance and we spoke about his historical context. Can you just give us um, a little bit of insight as the investment consultant, kind of like what you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. So I would mention that what Steve and Lorna have mentioned, what they've walked through is typical of what we've seen most institutional investors go through in this environment. So with equities going through a correction, losing over 20%, uh, with fixed income yields going down to record lows once again in such a short period of time, these have been developments and phenomenon that no inv institutional investor can avoid. So I think all of the headwinds that are facing the Chicago plans are the same headwinds that are being faced by the majority of institutional investors out there. So everything that they've just mentioned is exactly what we're talking to the bulk of our clients about right now uh, in this environment. Uh, so in this environment, what's key? Uh, looking for volatility management, making sure there are portions of the portfolio that are defensive enough. Uh, going to one of Craig's comments earlier around having sufficient liquidity in place. That's also a key requirement for many of our clients, making sure that they have sufficient cash on hand to meet benefit payments when they're due. Uh, so again, really, as we scale back and we look at everything from a macro standpoint, COVID-19 has not been discriminated in the sense of everyone's been impacted. Every pension fund has been impacted. Every investor has been impacted. And therefore, everything that Steve and Lorna have mentioned Again, echoes very true, I think, for uh, the vast majority of institutional investors, not only in the U.S., but I would say across the world. Excellent. Thank you. And um, as we are getting ready to close, I want to thank Lorna, Steve, Kwaku, Ashley, and Craig for being with us on today and providing so much helpful information. I thank everyone. Um, I, I really think that people will leave here today and we're hoping with a better understanding of what our office as city treasurer is doing to protect the city's finances during these uncertain times. Um, we thank everyone for tuning in to Money Mondays with Melissa. And I'll tell you, I have never done a Money Mondays with absolutely no questions from the audience. This has been amazing. I don't know if I'll say kudos to the panelists. I give you credit for the information that you provided. Um, it, it obviously was very helpful and um, in, in the explanation. So thank you for that, for being clear and speaking in terms that everyone can understand, um, regardless as to whether they're an industry expert or whether they're a residents that have not had a financial class ever in life. So thank you for what you have provided. I'll also say, um, I thought that this was a very helpful webinar in speaking about really the duties of myself as city treasurer um, in being the city treasurer to protect taxpayers dollars, but also being the chairman of the Catalyst Fund and also being um, the only elected official that sits on all four of the city's pension funds. So really thank you for this webinar on today. We will be sharing the notes and materials with everyone that um, registered via email and I encourage you to continue to follow us at city treasurer, Chicago treasurer, chicagocitytreasurer.com, too many websites. Uh, chicagocitytreasurer.com, where you'll find a wealth of resources for keeping yourself, your family, and your small business financially healthy. I'd also like to invite you to sign up for our weekly newsletter, where we share tips every week and really let you know about events such as this. You can sign up, again, through chicagocitytreasurer.com, where you can sign up right there to be um, a part of our weekly newsletters. And after today, I do want to mention this in closing. As we mention and, and we move into phase four, Money Mondays with Melissa will shift to a once a month schedule. So our next webinar will be on Monday, July 27th. But before we go, I do want to say a quick reminder that Chicago is opening back up. We're in phase four 
after several months of shutdown, but we're far from out of the woods. So please be safe, be safe, so stay socially distanced, wear your mask so we can keep each other healthy. We'll see you again in July. And this concludes our um, webinar on today, but we hope that you also have a July 4th um, great holiday weekend. I also mentioned that, thank you. Great, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for attending. You may now disconnect.